Hello out there in YouTube or wherever you're watching this today. I have a special treat for you. We have Dr. Gretchen Kabaki. She is a psychologist and she is also a fellow sister. And I'm just going to give uh, Dr. Gretchen a moment to share her story with you because I think that she has not only some incredible insights as someone who has lived through PCOS, but she also has uh, the professional training to help you maybe sort through some of the uh, mental health and uh, mindset issues that she might be dealing with as a woman living with PCOS. So Dr. Gretchen, could you tell us a little bit about your story and how you came to be kind of the PCOS psychologist? Sure. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, so I was diagnosed about 30 years ago, which was before I was a psychologist. And it was in the time where we didn't have Google and they threw a pack of birth control pills at me and said, okay, come back and see us when you want to get pregnant. And I went on my merry way and had no idea what else was brewing in my body. And I had had a lot of background and studies in my early life in holistic and integrative approaches, things like yoga and meditation. And so I was doing those things and using those things. And it probably helped stabilize. But then as I got older and developed more symptoms, started having surgeries for my symptoms, I realized that no one was tending to the emotional side of this. I was really depressed, anxious irritable, like unbelievably irritable. Again, nobody explaining it. So I would spend a lot of time in the UCLA biomed library reading up on this stuff. I became a psychologist and went down the medical path and realized that so many women are dealing with infertility, PCOS related depression, anxiety, mood disorders, eating disorders, that it was huge. And that if you don't tend to the psychological side of things, you are not gonna do very well tending to the physical side of things. So it felt really important for me to get that message out there, which is why I created PCOS Wellness, which is all about the psychological effects of PCOS and how to deal with them and why I help women with PCOS in my practice. Wow, and that's such like an amazing story because not only did you, um, you kind of became like your own hero. You, you, you developed this, this way of taking charge of your situation and being your number one advocate. But then you turned around and got and invested a ton of time into becoming a therapist and psychologist. That's a lot of work. And um, you, you were able to give back in like a tremendous way to this community. So for that, we thank you. And actually, we met um, a few years back when I was just starting out as a personal trainer. And you somehow... Mm -hmm found me in Los Angeles and, and figured out from my little website that I had PCOS and you sent me one of your clients and we had a great experience working together for a few years. Yeah. But I mean, that's just, the, I think that says a lot about like who you are as a, as a medical professional that you would take the time to find a personal trainer who understood PCOS because I was knocking down on the doors of gynecologists all the time saying, hey, I think I have something that could help your patients. And mm -hmm. I never got a response from anyone. And it was so frustrating, um, both as uh, a woman with PCOS and as a, somebody who wanted to start this kind of business. Yeah, I obviously it's incredibly needed. And now back then they were talking about 10% of women having PCOS. Now we're talking about 20, 22% of women having PCOS. So to me, this is a huge and dramatic need. Um, but yeah, I, I have a little antenna and if anybody pops up and I can tell from even looking at them, <laughs> their symptoms, I'm like, PCOS, PCOS, <laughs> let me reach out to that person. And now it's more, you know, it's easier to do it. But yeah, back then that was definitely important. <laughs> well, we are, um, we talked a little bit beforehand before we clicked record. And, uh, one thing that I know that, um, gets people a little wound up this time of year because it's November when we're talking mm -hmm. is managing your PCOS nutrition and the holidays and the social pressures that come around food. And I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about some of the situations you see some of your clients facing during the holidays and how you suggest that they handle them. Sure. It is a big deal, and it really is something. I, I think of the holidays as starting just before Halloween because all the candy appears. Oh, so yeah. all the horrible <laughs> food temptations are extra strong, and it runs through about Valentine's Day. Uh, but particularly these holidays of Thanksgiving and Christmas in the United States and Hanukkah, um, all of that is something that 
it tends to be a free for all. You know, historically people will gain five to 10 pounds during the holiday season because, oh, it's the holidays, here another little piece of candy, you know, have some grandma's rum cake, whatever it is. Well, of course, all of the traditional foods, I mean, almost all of them are things that are really bad for you. Other than maybe plain yams. I can't think of anything else. Got the yams and the turkey. If you don't put any marshmallows on the yams. <laughs> <laughs> And then you want some. <laughs> I would never do that. Um, but I know a lot of people love that. Um, yeah, so it's something where there's a lot of pressure and there's this idea of it's special and there's an emotional thing that goes along with it, which is it's warm, it's fuzzy, it's happy, it's friendly. It reminds you of better times, maybe times when you didn't even know you had PCOS. It used to be people just eight. They didn't think and hyper-program their eating and their macros and their carb count and their fat grams and all of that. And that's got a huge stress built into it. And it's something that I think it's far too easy. And people, we were talking about, you know, that family doesn't understand your little metabolic problem, right? Right. They think you'll be able to take a day off. And what I always say, because I have early onset type 2 diabetes as a result of not knowing anything about what was going to happen with my PCOS, um, I always say, I get angry sometimes, and I say, you know, diabetes doesn't take a day off. I'm going for a really long walk on Thanksgiving. I manage the dinner aspect. I usually cook so that I can control the menu a lot more. Mm -hmm. I do believe wholeheartedly in grass-fed butter. Um, as a health food. <laughs> so <Me too>. <laughs> I do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, but I think in terms of like handling the family stuff, part of it is being direct, but being direct can elicit challenges from family. And there are a lot of people, frankly, who, even though they say they love you, want to see you fail. Because if you fail, then you're just like them. Why? Because 90% of people at least fail diets. And if you're struggling, they're struggling with you as opposed to seeing you succeed and go on and become something closer to the idealized perfect vision of whatever, wife, mother, girlfriend, sister, whatever it is. And so there's that thing where it's equating food with love. If you reject my food, you're rejecting my love. And that's not true. You are rejecting food that is bad for you. Right. And that's not something that's really even a rule that I can say. I mean, I can definitely tell you that probably the marshmallows in the bag are really bad for you. <laughs> Pretty sure about that, you know, but beyond that, I try to depathologize the food and make it so that there's no good foods or no bad foods, but also to be mindful, always bringing mindfulness to eating. And that includes on Thanksgiving. I believe that you should enjoy a little piece of pie. You should enjoy a little stuffing. You know, but don't eat yourself into a carb coma. You're not going to feel good oh. afterwards. You're going to feel like you failed, but you're also highly likely, and you know, most of us probably have done this. You show up with your own steamed vegetables and you have a little thin slice of the turkey breast and sit there and look longingly at everything everybody else is eating with gusto, right? That's possible that you can have fun and feel connected to your family but it's also something where i'm really all about moderation you know at this point i really really solidly fall in the middle on it but also don't take leftovers necessarily you know you don't need to be eating stuffing and gravy for the next seven days maybe you take the cur turkey carcass and make a soup out of it there right? you go <laughs> so and, and you get some of that connection still, which is like, this is the turkey, you know, if you're into the turkey, right? Mm -hmm. But having, telling people up front, I have some limitations about what I'm eating right now. I'll manage them. You don't need to do anything special for me. And plan accordingly. If you know, you know, you come from a Southern family and everything is drowned in butter and gravy, maybe you do need to cook a side dish that's a little bit cleaner. Right, so it's about being proactive, making choices that are going to feel good to you. Maybe nobody else eats it. Decide ahead of time not to be insulted, <laughs> right? Um, and if there is somebody who's an ally around food in your family, then enlist them to be helpful also, you know, to kind of serve as a person who's also not showing up with a plate heaped with enough food to serve six people. You know, choose your one serving 
enjoy what you're going to enjoy and stop. Because I think we get caught up in this, everybody eats till the state of oblivion, right? And it's not necessary. And it, well, it's like saying that the more you eat, the better it is. Like, the first piece doesn't taste any better than the second piece. You're just facing some indigestion now. Exactly. And I think also just, it's kind of, it's less about engaging with other people around it. Because, you know, as, as a general member of the population, I mean, as a as a health psychologist and PCOS patient, I'm deeply fascinated with what everybody's eating because I think it's really important to your mental health and, and your gut function and serotonin and all of that stuff. But it is something where we're dealing with an unbalanced body mm-hmm. always. So the more out of balance we go, the harder it's going to be to get back in line. So do you want to be off for an entire three-day period or five-day period or a week or month? Because a lot of times this slides right into Christmas. Right. It's like this blur of turkey. (laughs) Exactly. And so knowing yourself and knowing what you need, is it going to be okay? Like, are you a moderator or are you a person who needs to draw really hard lines? And we kind of fall half and half into those camps. I'm a moderator. You know, I would get rebellious and overdo it if I said that everything was off limits. Because I've done that about a hundred (laughs) times. My pursuit of PCOS perfection. Um, Could you talk a little bit more about um, a moderator and abstainer? I think that that's um, a really good thing to know about yourself, what I would call putting in your owner's manual. Can you tell us what, so that everybody knows what that means? Yeah, so there's actually been a bunch of research done on behavior modification, um, which is what we're all sort of practicing when we get PCOS. We're trying to deal with developing a healthier lifestyle is how do we modify behaviors? And it turns out that probably about half of us do really well with drawing a hard line. I'm not eating sugar ever again. Boom. It's miserable. You white knuckle it through, you know, two, three weeks of that. And then you emerge on the other side and you never look back. The other half of us are people who go into straight up rebellion the second that happens. Mm -hmm. If you say diet to me, I am immediately going to do what's called the last supper. (laughs) five pounds overnight because I have eaten everything in sight because I'm fearful that I'm going to be deprived of those foods again. So knowing that about myself, I know that I have to make reasonable choices and choose the moderate path. And so when you know that you have a lot more power to manage effectively because both ways can work and do work. But if you choose the wrong one for your temperament, it's going to be counterproductive. That is, I just, I think that's something that took me a long time, especially as a fitness professional, because I think um, in the fitness marketing world, we tend to glamorize the abstainer type of diets. Yes. Um, Mostly because they're much easier to write about if you're a fitness blogger. (laughs) You know, it's it's less, it's like so much more difficult to write about moderation. But I'm really a moderator where I would get with the, one of my clients aptly describes as an angry teenager mode. And I'd be like, you told me to do this. Uh Uh-uh. I'm doing the opposite because, and I'm arguing with myself, right? I've decided I'm going to abstain from this. And now I'm going way over the line with my ice cream because I said I was going to eat less of it. Um, but that's something I know about myself now, so I don't drift towards those abstainer um, sort of diets. On the other hand, and I think if I had to guess, I'd say a lot of people usually fall under moderator, but if you are an abstainer, that's not a bad thing either. If that works for you, you should own it, right? Absolutely. But And here's the thing with PCOS that gets a little bit tricky, mm-hmm. is, and, and I absolutely agree with you that it is so much easier to market the hard line abstaining than it is to market the moderation path. Um I had published a recipe for gluten-free brownies and got a bunch of negative feedback, even though they're the best brownies on the planet, because I was encouraging women with PCOS to eat sugar. I was like, you know, there's half a cup of sugar in 64 brownies. (laughs) Yes, it's actually the white stuff. However, if you really love chocolate, you really like a little sweet treat, this is a good approach, you know? And there's a lot of stuff that is, we have to, we have to make our own choices and not necessarily follow what the so-called conventional wisdom is, because it really is something where um, it's not about who has the best plan, it's who has the best marketing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And it's really great to say, I cut out, you know, sugar, flour, alcohol, blah, blah, blah. And I lost 15 pounds and now this, and here's my before and after picture, right? And I've done interviews for people who are doing like before and after articles. They don't want anything moderate. They only want to hear about the extreme approach. <laughs> right. Well, it's and so impressive, you know? It is, but here's the thing. Have you ever noticed looking deeper? There's a particularly famous person who is not in the PCOS world, but no one she ever writes about has lost more than 14 pounds. Hmm. But if you give up everything for X number of weeks, you will definitely lose 14 pounds. Yeah. Granted, a lot. How long can you sustain it is my question. Because sustaining is what gives you those feelings of empowerment it's how you know what's different if you do try a medication or if you do change your exercise. Because when you're trying to change too many things all at once, for most of us, that gets overwhelming. Sure. It's very, very rare for a person to be able to make total radical overnight change. And that's and just science, right? Just so that everybody has permission to take things one step at a time. Am I wrong in saying that there is a lot of really good research out there saying that almost every human is better at doing it kind of one step at a time? There is a lot of research about that, definitely. One step at a time. It tends to be something where, I just remember, my sister had this calendar that was like 30 days of change. And, you know, day one was like, eat butter instead of margarine. Day two was walk around the block for 10 minutes. You know, by the end of the 30 days, you had made all these great healthy changes. And I thought, you know, that's really a sane approach. We do well when we don't feel threatened. And food really is an emotional issue. Yes. So when you take away the thing I love, the thing I associate with warmth, family, love, happiness, generosity, caring, nurturing, which is truthfully most of us, because there's a handful of people that are the eat to live people, you know, it's just the food is fuel for the machine, right? Yeah. Everything else has got a whole bunch of psychological, spiritual, emotional, religious connotations around the food that complicate it a lot. And easing yourself into it, you feel safe, you feel comfortable, you get a little bit of a feeling of, oh, I can do this, I have success. Yeah, well, maybe it wouldn't be so bad if I ate another vegetable every day. Cool. Huh. The next thing you know, it's like, you know, I actually have a pretty clean diet. I get enough sleep and, you know, I do meditation every day and hmm, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Just because, sort of sneak it, it sneaks up on you that way. Yeah. I, you know, because this is the long game. Mm -hmm. It would be really awesome if you could fix this all in 30 days and never have to deal with it again. It's not like that no. at all. It wasn't for me at least. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to meet that person though. That would be incredible. Well, and you know, I've spent a long time figuring out how this works, right? And also then trying to figure out how to teach it to other people, which is a whole other step in improving it. And it's and it's hard because, like you said, the moderation part mm -hmm. is, it's not as glamorous. No, it's not glamorous at all. <laughs> you know, PCOS in general is not a glamorous condition. Yeah, no, that's true. It's not a glamorous <laughs> condition, <laughs> you know? I think that we can all agree out there that that is true. Um, uh, that's hard. But yeah, is. I'm a big supporter of moderation, even though it is probably the longer, slower, and ultimately harder in some ways path. Mm -hmm. I think it's a more effective and more sustainable path. And it gives you tools in the process. It's not just taking in somebody else's ideas and following them slavishly. It's figuring out your body and what works for your body and your brain. Okay, so um, I'm a big fan of that kind of concept of self-experimentation, especially because I've talked to uh, quite a few registered dietitians and researchers in PCOS, and, and any one of them will tell you, we're so far off from finding a perfect diet for PCOS that there's plenty of room for variation. Yeah. Um, but what I find is that a lot of women kind of struggle with how to talk to themselves about <laughs> experimenting and allowing themselves to maybe um, view things a little bit differently when an experiment doesn't work. Like maybe they try something and it doesn't work and they stamp like a big red mark of fail on there. Does that right. get in the way of your progress? Because I 
I would think it would. Yes, absolutely. Which again is part of why I'm opposed to these all or nothing sorts of lifestyle plans or diets. You're going to fail at some point. First of all, I give you permission to fail all day long every day because (laughs) we learn more from our failures and mistakes than we do from our successes. If you are at all interested in your own process and dedicated to the changes, you're going to look and go, why was it that when I ate that food at noon, I felt fine all afternoon, but when I ate it at nine night, I didn't feel so good. Hmm. That's interesting. So having an attitude of curiosity Mm -hmm. as opposed to judgment is going to be really helpful in overcoming that and looking at it as a lifelong evolving experiment. And it's not gonna take all of your life to figure out (laughs) an exercise plan that feels good to you, but it may take a while, hopefully a lot less than it took me. Um, It's something that we're giving yourself that permission and be a little bit analytical about it. You know, trying to step back, and this is gonna sound funny coming from a psychologist, but taking some of the emotional charge out of it and just looking at it and going, huh, How did I feel? Did I feel better? Did I feel worse? Do I feel happier? Do I feel miserable? Am I more tired? Am I more anxious? Am I more depressed? Do I actually feel kind of perky and good? Am I not even thinking about my symptoms? That might be an answer. That's the the sweet spot, right? When you forgot you had PCOS. (laughs) Right, right. And that is so different for people. I mean, there's, there are some universals, as you know, You know, anybody who's regularly eating nothing but pasta is probably going to feel like garbage. Right. Can you eat a little tiny side of pasta every now and then because you really, really, really love it? Yes, you can, unless you have celiac disease. Yeah. You can. It's not a crime. Well, what I like what you said that that really stuck out to me and that I would take away from what you just said is that um, the, the difference between judgment and curiosity about yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That to me is is huge because I I know that I get would get into these like these thought processes and conversations with myself where it would be like you can't deadlift your body weight. Mm. What kind of a personal trainer are you? Instead of which would make me feel terrible and almost even me who loves the gym doesn't want to go to the gym the next day, right? Yeah, that's that's heavy judgment on yourself and your skill set. Right, exactly. And and then I would if if I had just said to myself, and this is my younger self, I've gotten over this a little bit, but um, you know, I have significant scoliosis. That I wonder if that's why my deadlift isn't as powerful as it should be for my size and experience level in the gym. And that brings up like I can learn so much about myself when I'm curious and nice. And I learned right absolutely nothing by judging myself like that. Exactly. That, that is a perfect example of that. And it's something we're looking at, you know, I, I teach meditation quite often, pretty much to everybody. Um, and everyone says, I can't do this. It's so hard. My mind is going everywhere. And I say, <laughs> congratulations, you're doing it right. <laughs> because even the monks in their monasteries have wandering minds. And that's something to be curious about. Where is your mind going? Do you need to actually focus on that thought? Or can you just let it go and go, hmm, thought. There goes another thought. Wow, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> focus, right? Just that is calming in that few seconds there. Yeah, just letting you know yourself just be instead of constantly judging. Right, because we are constantly judging and being judged. And, you know, a lot of what we're talking about, too, like the PCOS world now basically exists online. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. Even in Los Angeles, there's not a cohesive group that meets regularly of PCOS patients. I know. It's, It's kind of amazing. It is kind of amazing. And so we find the support there, but that's also a place where we tend to forget that people are often showcasing their best selves. And this whole idea of, of missing out on something or there's a, a subtle and sometimes not so subtle level of competition about it. And I think especially when it comes to the world of healthcare, there is that competitive element. You know, well, I lost 32 pounds because I'm morally superior for giving up X, mm-hmm. right? 
And that I don't think is a healthy long-term attitude. I see, and there's starting to be some studies on what that whole FOMO, fear of missing out, for example, like on Facebook, that competitiveness is actually resulting in a lot more stress, depression, and anxiety. Recent study show of college students showed that the reason they're going in for therapy is because they aren't really sure if they want to live or not. Oh. How did that happen? And that's just so-called normal, healthy people. What about the rest of us who actually have health issues that are already weighing us down? What is the rest of that doing to us? So I often prescribe a news fast or a social media fast to people. So one of the things I would say to your viewers is, you know, if you're really struggling with a lot of this and feeling that sort of competition and failure and struggle, 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 fail more, and, you know, feel bad because somebody else is succeeding. It's okay to extract yourself from that for a while, and it might even be the healthier choice. It's good to come in and get support, and there are definitely a lot of online forums where you get people being really candid about their struggles, but it's not something that um, that is helpful, you know, if you are feeling it in a bad way. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing in terms of, of being online and that support community necessarily if it's not working for you. Well, I think you bring up an interesting point because, I mean, there's all these rooms or spaces available online for PCOS and not all of them are going to work for you. And, and that doesn't – and just because you don't fit into maybe a certain support group, there's this, this kind of uh, – problem of assigning moral judgment to where you don't or don't fit in and it being like an issue of your character but the the good thing news is there is so many places online to go to get the right kind of support you need right. so maybe if you haven't found the shoe that fits you can keep looking for it. or maybe you just need to step back because sometimes you're right if it doesn't matter where you are online if you're comparing yourself to everyone else that's just another level of stress that you're kind of you know hormonally you're also responding to right Absolutely. All of that stress contributes to increased secretion of cortisol, which, as we all know by now, because of the advertising, <laughs> causes abdominal fat. Most of us are not actually that skewed in terms of cortisol, so it's a nice idea to sell things, but not necessarily true. But the bottom line is that women with PCOS already have more stress, and it makes our health worse, not better. So decreasing stress, including social media stress, sometimes getting back to the holidays, that means maybe you opt not to spend the holidays with your family or your entire family, or maybe you go there for a few hours instead of staying for the weekend. And those are things where learning how to assert yourself for your overall health, I think, is part of the big picture. Because Again, it's not something where you can, you know, yeah, I listen to the Inside app for 10 minutes every morning. I meditated, right? I'm good. <laughs> no, it's, it's an all day, every day kind of, of practice and focus, you know, in taking care of yourself and learning what works for you. And there are going to be sacrifices. You know, it takes a lot of time to deal with an illness when you figure in meal planning and exercise and meditation and psychological support and whatever else. It does take more time. And that is also important. You know, you've got to make that a priority. Um, or you're probably not going to succeed at it. You know, you can't just squeeze this in in five minutes a day. Right. So two really big things that, like, I can think about from that is just, um, first of all, the, the, when you for, when I'm thinking of a person who's first diagnosed and you hear us talking about, like, this laundry list of things that you need to do to make PCOS better, Um that would bowl me over in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Hearing that. How do you get maybe a PCOS newbie to kind of um, navigate that diagnosis and, and get on the road to change? But also, I feel like there's this real sense of loss after you get diagnosed. Maybe you always thought you were perfectly healthy and someone took that away from you with a piece of paper. Absolutely. Um, how, how do you get started on healing that? Yeah, that's yeah, it's funny you ask that because I'm a certified bereavement facilitator for adults and children. And... It's a sort of separate interest on a particular topic, but I discovered that there is so much grief and loss inherent in younger people getting a diagnosis, and especially with PCOS, because it does, there's the loss of the idea of being a healthy person. There's 75% of the time loss of fertility. There is this feeling that 
you're not normal, you're never going to be normal. And there's this grief or anticipatory grief about all of what might happen and what you might not have. You know, like if you don't have the perfect body, you're not gonna get the perfect boyfriend, which leads to the perfect husband, which leads to the perfect baby, right? (laughs) Women do this. We go out on a date. They (laughs) do. We go out on a first date, you know, we're already designing the wedding dress. And it's the same sort of thing in connection with your health. There tends to be And this is part of the the depression. And it's this idea of kind of globalizing the fears and the sensations associated with the idea of illness. And when somebody tells you something, they don't usually say, now you have a chronic illness. They'll say you've got PCOS, but it is a chronic illness. And, you know, it's hard to reconcile because mostly we look pretty okay and healthy and distinguishable from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm then you start to notice the things that you're also losing, like this idea of femininity for many women. You know, if you have a more masculinized body type, a lot of antigens resulting in a lot of excess body hair, that sort of thing, it is painful. And I think it is something that needs to be mourned. And that's often a first step in letting go of what was or what you thought you were or were going to be or going to have. It has to change. You don't really know how that's gonna turn out now. So once you start working on that, for the new people who come in, and I do see this, and it is really awful. I've, I've seen people come in with, I literally had one woman once bring me one of those five by seven pill boxes. You know, it's like seven days in the week and then morning, mid-morning, lunch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Filled up with all these supplements that the doctor said, you have to take all of these, and here's the exercise prescription, and here's the diet you have to follow. And guess what she did with all of that? She tried for two weeks and then became completely frazzled, <laughs> probably. It would actually be a good outcome. <laughs> Usually, she takes a few of the pills, ends up in tears, says, I can't do this, and then she calls me because she is so depressed and can't cope. Wow. Yeah. If you're lucky. If you're lucky, you go- she, you, they called you. If you're not so lucky, you're just sitting on your couch thinking, what do I do now, right? I might as well just keep doing what I've been doing because there's no way on earth I can ever assimilate all of this. And there's no way I can do it all is the thought. So what I really do is slow it down, break it down into small bits that are manageable where you can achieve some success. So just like you would do in personal training, you don't immediately say, okay, tomorrow you're running a marathon. No. How about we get you walking first? Yeah, exactly. On a treadmill. How about we do couch to 5k? right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing where we look at what's the worst problem that you've got associated with your PCOS right now. If you're sitting on my couch, it may well be the depression because there's no motivation that goes along with having a depression. So we'll work on the depression and a little bit of behavioral health change. Can I get you to walk around for five minutes a day? Yeah. Do that for a couple weeks. In fact, I lost 70 pounds by starting out with a 10 minute walk. I completely believe that. Yeah, I've seen that happen, that these small changes make, they kind of bleed into your life in other ways too. So maybe you start with the walk and you start feeling better. Right. And I also will often start, when it comes to the food part, um, not taking something away, Mm. but adding something. So instead of saying, you can't drink juice ever again, and by the way, don't drink juice, it's so bad. (laughs) Not a health food. (laughs) No matter what they say. Or sugar. Um, Just my little PSA there. (laughs) I will ask them to do something like add a serving of vegetables. I love that. I call it um, changing your diet through addition instead of subtraction. Yeah. And I educate them that a serving of vegetables is half a cup of cooked vegetables. Could you... Order an omelet that's stuffed with vegetables. Oh, there, you just did it. Right? <laughs> that's so much easier than you can never drink orange juice again. That's a wonderful tool um, for people just to take home right now is if you're thinking about changing your diet, you probably, if, if I'm guessing, made a laundry list of all the things you never should eat again or stop eating or eat less of. But instead of thinking... What can I eat more of? And maybe you'll find that you kind of like some of this stuff and it kind of crowds out the stuff that you shouldn't be eating as much of. Yeah. 
like, and that idea um, is, it actually comes from sculpture, because my background is in art, actually, in early days, <laughs> and there's additive and subtractive sculpture, additive being where you build on, you know, adding little pieces of clay, and subtractive being, like, you take out a block of wood and carve it out, and you see the thing, so that additive and subtractive both give you a sculpture in the end. What's the easier method? Well, I don't know. For me, it was actually the additive method. Mm -hmm. And with doing that, like you say, it'll eventually crowd out other behaviors. If you're eating all those vegetables first thing in the morning, somehow you're not actually craving a muffin at 1030 in the morning. Exactly. It okay. does happen. Well, it's not. a real thing. <laughs> exactly. Because you're full of eggs and good fat and vegetables. I love that image. I think that's like a great place to kind of wrap up our conversation today is that just close your eyes and picture the sculpture of your life. And if you have PCOS, maybe, you know, it's an additive sculpture. Maybe you start putting these, you know, little mind mounds of clay into your life, whether it's a meditation this month and walking next month and just start creating this life instead of thinking about all that you're losing, think about all that you could gain because your PCOS is encouraging you to try new things. Right. And, and that's the thing also about, you know, I hear so much about loss um, with my clients, mm -hmm. what you have to give up, right? And this is particularly the food, but I'm a person who likes to cook. I like to bake. What I learned is that it forces my creativity. Instead of making the thing I've always made, now I am looking up new recipes. I am trying stuff. I'm also having some epic failures. <laughs> <laughs> Which are very ego damaging for a while. <laughs> until I realized that alternative baking is just different. Um, <laughs> But learning that and getting some humbleness about it and going, oh, look at that, I failed, and look at that, I just announced that to a national, maybe even international audience. <laughs> I'm still alive, right? Right. So you can pick can, up these things and try them out and fail and try something new, and that would make you completely normal and an active participant in your health. Exactly. And when you're attempting to make changes, that is as good as actually having completed the change in my book. That is, if you, if you don't get the outcome that you wanted, it's okay. It's just an experiment. You're going to try again tomorrow and do something slightly different and see how it goes. Yeah, you can control what you do. You can't control the outcome. Right. And detaching from the outcome, I think, is one of the most powerful things because we're very goal-oriented, and the goal always seems to be, you know, Lose 50 pounds, get pregnant, and whatever else, right? And those might not be the end result, but you might get a whole lot healthier and happier along the way. Uh, yes, exactly. Wonderful. Well, I want to leave with just one thing. If tomorrow your best friend in the world called you and said, I have PCOS, what would be the first piece of advice that you would lovingly share with her? Mm, I would say... <laughs> I would ask her what she needs support with, and I would give her support on that very specific thing. But I would also say that it is a long-term journey. It is not a short-term fix. And to be patient with yourself and to be really kind and gentle with yourself, because we are getting hammered all the time by the outside world's messaging, whether it's our traditional doctors or the diet advertising or whatever it is, just be kind to yourself and be patient, be persistent, and you will get there. You heard it from an expert. Be nice to yourself and be patient and you'll get there. All right. Well, thanks for being with us, guys. And thank you so much, Dr. Gretchen. It's been just amazing well, to talk to you today. Yeah, it was delightful talking to you as well. And I look forward to seeing some of you guys on the PCOS Psychology page, which is found on Facebook. I've created it quite recently. It's a group where you have to ask to be let in, but I'll let you in. And <laughs> it's a place where I provide a lot more education about these topics and expand on the stuff on PCOSWellness.com, which is the website that goes with this. And there's a lot of good blog posts talking about some of the more nuanced aspects of the psychological stuff that goes with PCOS specifically. So. Absolutely. And I think you have some, some resources, like some books on there. And are you writing a book too? 
I am writing a book. So yeah, we will have to have you back on to talk about Absolutely. your book after I read Absolutely. it. Absolutely, you will be one of the first to get a copy. And <laughs> I love it. Right now, the working title is the PCOS Mood Cure, and it's going to focus on a holistic and integrative self-help program for improving your mental health so that you can improve your physical health. Oh, it's just so nice to have someone with your perspective in our PCOS world right now because I just, you know, there, with every talk about supplements and every little bit about exercise, it's great, but there's this whole world happening inside of your head that goes along with PCOS, and I just don't think it, we're talking about it enough, so I'm really glad you're here and sharing it. We're not, and I could throw statistics at you all day long, but the reality is that just talking about it and doing it like this and discovering what other people are doing. And I really love your approach too about taking more health at any size and making peace with food and having mindful eating and mindful exercise. Totally in sync with what I'm talking about. So this is good.